Scientists, engineers, policymakers, and journalists gathered for the American Association for the Advancement of Science Conference. One of the topics was the artificial manipulation of the Earth's climate, also called geoengineering. During the meeting, scientists spoke about the plausibility of implementing geoengineering campaigns throughout the world under the guise of preventing global warming. One widely accepted theory was to block the sun by spraying something into the atmosphere. When they were asked about existing aerosol programs, they stated clearly that no such programs have ever been implemented. But strangely, these proposals sounded exactly like what people around the world are claiming is already happening. When I found out that the American Association for the Advancement of Science was going to be held down here and the main body of uh, topics would be on geoengineering, I had to come. I, I had to be in on this. I had to hear what these top climate change scientists had to say. Uh, and as the other question about you know, chemtrails and whether geoengineering is being deployed right now without uh, our knowledge, uh, I don't have any personal insight into that um, other than to say that you know, I've worked in government at uh, you know, pretty high levels in the White House and in, in, uh, at state government. You know, I'm personally skeptical of that. Um, uh, but obviously you never know what you don't know. It is called geoengineering fighting global warming by putting a chemical dust in the atmosphere and reflecting harmful radiation back into space. We take geoengineering to mean deliberate, large-scale intervention in the Earth system. There are a variety of schemes that have been discussed for geoengineering. A classic example is uh, injecting reflecting particles into Earth orbit. Nevertheless, there might be some good reason to think about alumina. It turns out, first of all, there's been a lot of work on the environmental consequences of alumina in the stratosphere. The big deal, really, is that alumina has four times the volumetric rate of forcing it for small particles, as does sulfur. And that means you have four times the surface area for the same rate of forcing. And this is a much bigger deal. You have roughly 16 times less the coagulation rate. And that's the thing that really drives removal. So you could get away, we think, with much smaller mass fluxes. So that's why we see things like in the uh, use, use aircraft patent from the 89, they talk about aluminum. And that's why we're seeing in the surface water samples aluminum. And here's David Keith saying uh, that aluminum has four times the reflective uh, volume surface area. So they'd like us to think that we're talking about sulfur, but here they slipped up and let it out that uh, aluminum is four times better to achieving their ends, and it sounds like it's kind of the one they don't want us to know the effects of. Mm. The little picture is from a nanofabrication study, which shows you can make very high quality, and do this in just a jet in a very simple way, make high quality alumina particles just by spraying alumina vapor out, which oxidizes. So it's certainly in principle possible to do that, and there's a big literature that's already looked at that. And you could do that by either building new versions of these aircraft or even re-engineering existing aircraft. So there's some ideas of that. So you go to an engineering firm and you want this done. They don't say this is hard or unusual. They say, okay, yes, we could do it. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. That means that implementation decisions will be risk-to-risk -risk decisions. The risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it. And it makes the problem of how we govern it fundamentally harder and different and normal. So I've told you that's cheap to deliver materials to the stratosphere, and I'm convinced that's true. I don't think that will change. But I think the more we do research, the less easy this will look, the more complicated the environmental effects will look. And that's a good thing, because right now it looks too easy. So I think that if we do more research, we're likely to find out that it's harder and more complicated than we thought, and that the side effects are harder to manage, and that's a healthy outcome that will make it easier to do the management. Of course, the opposite reaction is possible. It's an empirical question how people will actually react to knowledge about this. Another reaction is to say, if these crazy scientists are so concerned about putting CO2 in the atmosphere, they want to think about these things, then that might actually mean we should be more serious about the risks of CO2 in the atmosphere. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. Um, numerous air quality studies, uh, including from uh, CARB, California Air Quality Resource Board, have named submicron sized particulates as being particularly harmful for human respiration. Through all the discussions today, uh, I have not heard any mention of this fallout, and has, has this been studied, and also the effects of a highly reactive metal like aluminum on toxifying soils and waters? The question is, what would be the effects of these materials on human health if they came down into the stratosphere? In, uh, in, in particular, uh, 
small particles and aluminum. So, so the, the collaborators of mine working on the aerosol scheme are actually folks from Carnegie Mellon who focused on human health impacts. And while we haven't published it, that was the very first thing we did, was do the order of magnitude calculation in a level pencil and paper, but with an expert on human health impacts about whether there could be an issue. And, and for aluminum or other particles, there are a lot of toxicological things that need to get looked at seriously. But if you're just thinking about the sheer number of particles and the hu helmet, human health impact of small particles, the answer is, well, we haven't published it. That was the first thing we looked at with some of the leading experts who do uh, epidemiological research on human health impacts, and it's not even close to being an issue. Just clarify, so 10 megatons of aluminum dumped into the, the uh, atmosphere would have no human health impacts. So, so let me be more careful here. We're to separate out the toxicological, so the Illumina we've only begun to research and published nothing. The Illumina we've only begun to research and published nothing. Dane looked at him and he said, so you're telling me that spraying 10 to 20 megatons of aluminum, as you said, would have no human health effects? He took a deep breath and he swallowed and he said, let me be more careful here. We haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow. We haven't looked at it. And that, for me, that was the whole main point of, of what is, is going to be coming out to the public. It's, it's the damaging effects of aluminum that are being found around the world in massive amounts. Here's David Keith confronted on this very issue, and he, he looked, you know, at that point like, like they just let the cat out of the bag. Mm -hmm. We haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. It.